You are listening to the Bethel Church Sermon Podcast, a ministry of Bethel Church in Yale, South Dakota. In John chapter 6, we've been starting, we've been working our way through the Gospel of John. We've, in the last few weeks, we've uh, come to some uh, famous texts. We've talked about how uh, Jesus fed the the 5,000, which was probably uh, more like 20,000. You start counting uh, women and children along with the men. We talked about Jesus walking on the the water. And today we we start looking at what has been called uh, the bread of life discourse. This is the passage where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. It's one of those uh, famous texts where Jesus uses that, uh, that, that phrase, I am. A phrase that, that drove the religious leaders of the day nuts because they would go back and they remembered how God revealed himself to Moses. I am who I am. Jesus is, is saying or claiming to be equal with God by using that little phrase, I am this is the passage that we find that in. We don't, uh, we're not going to get to that today, but you'll still see it. Let's start in verse 22. If you would stand with me as we honor the reading of Scripture together. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and just and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples but that his disciples had gone away alone other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord Jesus had given thanks so when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples They themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father has set his seal. And they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. We're going to stop there. Let's pray again. Our Heavenly Father, this is, this is your word. Lord, we pray that you would just bless the, the reading of your word. We pray that you bless the, the proclamation of it. Lord, we pray that you would lead us and guide us into truth. Open our hearts. Lord, may we truly feast on your word. May you use it to satisfy and nourish us. And we pray all of these things for your honor, your glory, in the name of Jesus, amen. may be seated. We hear uh, sometimes today something like, uh, every person is created with a God-shaped hole in their heart. You ever heard a a saying like that? You've probably uh, maybe even used that saying. I I think that saying is really just an over-simplistic way of of saying what uh, St. Augustine said. Or what St. Augustine prayed, he prayed this. Thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in thee. Quite Quite a prayer. But what both statements get right is there is this universal restlessness, a universal longing, a universal search for completeness, to find a rest for the soul. And because there's this universal longing, this means also that there is this universal search for something that will uh, satisfy. Now we know that people find all sorts of things to try to fill this void to try to fill that uh, God-shaped hole or plug it with all sorts of uh, gods or small g. 
Everything from false religions to out-and-out paganism, hedonism, materialism, right? The list goes on and on where people go to satisfy, to find rest. Let me just say here that I think Augustine is right. God formed us for himself. Our hearts are restless until they find rest in him. If you found rest in Christ, you you know this to be true. I think this is a a wonderful quote. It's a great prayer. It's interesting, though, uh, when we come to Scripture, the Scriptures tell us that there is no one that is righteous. Not even one. There's no one who understands, and get this, no one who seeks God. We find that in Romans 3, 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses four, verse 14 says that we learn that, that people do not naturally accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to them. They cannot understand these things because they are spiritually discerned. I think from this we can say two important things. The first is that the spiritually discerned person that does not have understanding does not and cannot search for God, but they still search for something. That there's still that inherent restlessness that Augustine talked about. That the second thing I think that we see here right from the onset is that we say here that those who seek God find him Those who seek God and find him are first sought and found by God. One commentator said it this way. We seek because we've already been found. Now I bring this up at the onset here because this passage is really about seeking God. It's about searching for something. If you think about it, even to the unsaved person, the restless soul that is searching for something to fill the void... But they cannot. They they see Jesus. They they cannot see Jesus as the Savior that he is. But even for this person, Jesus does seem like a prime candidate to fill that hole. We've seen this. He's the one who can feed 20,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a cup of fish. I think in this story, we see quickly that these people were searching for Jesus but they were searching wrongly. So Jesus, he sent the disciples across the Sea of Galilee. You remember this? Jesus went up on the mountain to pray. Now it's important that the the multitude saw this. They saw the disciples take off. They saw Jesus stay. He went up in the mountain to be alone. It was evening. The people... They went home, they went to sleep. The next day, they got up early. They came there, and they saw there that there was only one boat. Jesus was not there. He had not entered the boat with his disciples. Now, it's a little bit difficult to discern what exactly John is trying to say here, that there was only one boat there that the disciples already took, or there was one boat still there, and there was no way for Jesus to leave. But whatever the, the case, the, the point is very clear. And that is that the people, the, cl- the crowds, couldn't imagine how Jesus could have gone. They couldn't imagine of a way that Jesus crossed the lake. Of course, Jesus walking across the water wasn't something that they thought about. So the crowd, they, they finally found Jesus. There were some other boats there. They, they got in and they, they found Jesus. And when they get there, they, they start to, to question him. Rabbi, when did you come here? It, it was confusing to them. They, they were keeping tabs on Jesus, but they lost him in the early morning hours when he left and they couldn't figure it out how he got over there by Capernaum. Now the interesting thing is that Jesus doesn't really answer that question. He just goes right to their their search for him. And he doesn't praise them for seeking him, but he, he rebukes them. 
And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for God the Father has set his seal on him. The crowd's motives in searching for Jesus were not right. They weren't good. They had missed the point of the sign. But before we're too critical of the crowd, we must step back for a moment and take a look at our own motives. Our own motives in searching for Jesus. I would suggest that even in the times when we think we are the most spiritual, our motives may not be right. They might be more selfish than we think they are. Think about the crowd's motives for a moment. They were seeking Jesus, and that is good, but at the same time, their focus was on themselves. It was inward. That sounds strange. I know it. They were seeking Jesus, but their focus was on themselves. But this is actually a big problem in the evangelical world today. That people go to great lengths to search for Jesus. They say they're searching for him. Perhaps it, is, it even seems like they're doing more to search for Jesus than any other. But when you start looking at motives, our motives, the focus of the search of why they want Jesus, you see the focus is actually not on Jesus, but it's on themselves. Here, Jesus clearly says that their search was about the food that he gave to them. That was the previous day. They got their fill. There were leftovers. Night came. Then morning. Time passed. They start looking for Jesus because it was time for a, an early morning brunch. Perhaps by the, the time they found Jesus, it was noon. Anyway, they were hungry again. That's what Jesus is getting at here. You're come all this way to find me because you just want to eat again? Their search for Jesus was actually a search for a full stomach. Don't we do this? We go to great lengths to find Jesus so that we will have some great spiritual experience find healing, to see somebody else heal. I went to a church while I was in college. I worked with uh, troubled teenagers, and the place I worked wanted them to go to this certain church. And it, was ultra, it was an ultra-charismatic church, and no one can fault them for not wanting to, to seek Jesus. It was very clear that they were uh, seeking Jesus, but the focus was all about what he could give them. They were seeking new revelation, new experiences, new manifestations of the Spirit. It's a pretty radical example, and it's very uh, low-hanging fruit, but we all have the, the tendency to. We think of our own human need and focus on that as we search for Jesus. We read Scripture not to see the all-surpassing worth of Jesus Christ, but we read it with expectations of how we're going to be fed. Did, do, you, do you see that? We, we read scripture not to see the all-surpassing worth of Jesus Christ, but with an expectation of how we're going to be fed. How will this benefit me? It isn't always easy to take a hard look at our motives. The fact is, when we come to the Jesus of the scriptures, we should be focused on what was missed here in our, in our text. And that is who Jesus is. Right? The sign. You, you come, you, you miss the sign, he says. The sign, it, it points to me. You're, you're missing it. I'm the bread of life. I'm the one that satisfies. One commentator said that he was convinced that in our day, in American Christianity, there is a lamentable tendency to focus on human need rather than on God himself. I want you to think about that. Is it true? 
The, the next time you're, you're reading your devotional, the next time you're reading a, a, your favorite Christian a living book, listening to the latest Christian podcast or radio show, what's the, the focus? This commentator went on to say that, that he was equally convinced that it was the worst possible way to have that need meant, met in our, in our lives. The worst possible way to have that need met is to focus on yourself when you come to Scripture and neglect focusing on who Christ is and how great he is. Let me just interject in our story, the people were searching for Jesus in hopes that he would feed them again, but he didn't. I know someone is thinking, isn't it true that people have needs and we need to, to come to Jesus to have our needs met? How is it that we're not supposed to focus on uh, these needs if, if Jesus meets our needs? And well, it's true that Jesus does meet people's needs and we should preach that Jesus is the answer to those needs. What is wrong, according to, to one scholar, is that it is possible to so focus on our needs that we are actually focusing on ourselves rather than Jesus. That's the problem. And, and when we're so focused on ourselves and our own problems, then we never get to the solution that Jesus wants to bring into our lives because we're so self-absorbed. It becomes the therapy session, right? The, well, what do you think? Will you answer that? You tell me. Now, say that you're tasked with leading a Bible study or a Sunday school class. How, how do you prepare, right? What's, what's the focus? I fear sometimes we become so focused on, on application. We miss the, the greatest and, and majestic nature of God in the text. In our search, our focus becomes on the application. And we really miss what Jesus is trying to teach us. I would agree with James Boyce when he says, I am convinced that one of the major steps to achieving good spiritual mental health is getting your mind off yourself entirely and on the Lord Jesus Christ instead. Doesn't this advice echo Jesus's here? Do not work for the food that perishes but the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. When these came seeking food in their minds or on their own stomachs, Jesus is saying, you, you missed the sign. The sign of Jesus feeding the multitude pointed beyond the physical food. That was the signpost. It pointed beyond the physical food that he gave. It pointed to himself. He's the bread of life. And in just a few short verses, he's going to say that. I am the bread of life. That is why this passage is known as the bread of life discourse. Jesus is the food that truly satisfied. So not only was the multitude's focus here on themselves, but just related to that, their focus was also on material things. Certainly in our search for Jesus, our focus can be on our needs. And, and not all the time are those things material, but sometimes they are. But here it is worth bringing up that the focus of these was material. Their minds were still on the material food that Jesus gave. They wanted more physical food to satisfy their belly. And what Jesus was offering was spiritual food that would satisfy their soul. I think the point here is simple. When our minds are so focused on the material, the physical, then we miss a greater blessing. Now, I, I want to make something very clear as I go on here, and that is that material things are not bad. God created a lot of material things, and he said of those things, these things are good. The problem isn't with the material things themselves. We're not uh, Gnostics that believe uh, the material world is evil. The problem isn't with the material things. The problem is, is when we let our love for possessions get in the way of seeing God for who he is. And then this limits our own growth. Just think of Achan for a moment. Here's a, a person that saw God at work in the taking of the city of Jericho. 
The story of uh, Jericho's, Jericho's fall to the Hebrews is one that, that children learn early in, in Sunday school. It's an amazing story. And Achan saw God's hand in all of this, and he was concerned with how he would benefit from it. He was more concerned about himself than what was going on uh, around him. And he took a, a beautiful Babylonian garment, 20 pieces of silver, and a bar of gold. When God said, you shouldn't take anything. And because of this, Israel lost the next battle to Ai, and, and Achan and his family were, were brought out into the open and judged for their crimes. Solomon was wise in almost, in so many respects, but when it came to wealth and women, these things, they ruined his spiritual life. Ananias and Sapphira, these lied to the Lord about money and were judged over it. Over and over we see those who focus on material things actually serve to draw them further from the Lord. So don't misunderstand. It wasn't the Babylonian garment itself. It wasn't the silver or the gold that was bad. It was the fact that Achan valued these things above the command of God, which clearly said, you don't take those things. Solomon, too, let his love for women and wealth cloud his judgment in his spiritual life suffer because he put those things over the command of God, Ananias and Sapphira. It wasn't the fact that they had land or they sold it for profit. It was that when they came to the Lord, their focus was on the material. They lied about it. They kept some for themselves and they wanted everyone to see one thing, but their hearts and their focus was on material possessions. And in their case, they died for it. Here's the question, and I think you can kind of bottom line it to this. What or who is in control? You see, in Aiken's life, what was in control? Was it God's command? Was it his lust for things? What won out? Are you in control of your possessions, or do they control you? When it comes to control, just think about the most uh, dramatic event in Abraham's life. He was an old man. His son Isaac was born. He came to love Isaac very much, and it makes sense. This was the, the promised son. The son that God's promises uh, to bring the Messiah would be fulfilled through. He would, Abraham would become a, a great nation because of him. It was important to remember here that even though Isaac was a God-given blessing, that blessing itself could overshadow the place that God alone should have in the heart of Abraham. God didn't bless Abraham by giving him Isaac and, and say, well, I gave, this is a blessing from God. You can have him at top priority in your life now. Now, I, I think, let me interject, I, I, parenthetical note, I think every parent has this tension. That, that our children or our spouse, I suppose, occupies a, a place in the heart that overshadows the place that only God should hold. Tell me it's not true in our lives. When we really think about it, that, that everything revolves around our children. And what does this say? I mean, I'll, I'll say something here that I think is probably going to be very unpopular, but yet it fits so well here. But when our lives that revolve around our children cause us to start limiting the things of God in our life, when we don't have time for the things of God in our life, when we don't have time for family worship because of our schedule, when we don't have time for Sunday morning worship, the worship of God, when that comes in conflict with the schedule that our children dictate, it should tell us something, shouldn't it? We often tell ourselves, well, this thing, this whatever it is, this, this sports thing, or, or whatever it is happens so rarely, but church happens every week, so we, we justify it. The problem, and I'll stress this again, isn't the event it isn't the thing. It's, in the, it's the control. It, it dictates. The fact is, 
And this isn't my opinion. The fact is, Sunday is the Lord's day. It isn't our day. It isn't our day to dictate. God dictates what we do on that day, and he has made it very clear that we come together in public worship. It isn't family devotions on the way to some event that is dictating our schedule that day. It is the day that God has said, you set aside to feast on the word of God in community. And God uses that. We call it an ordinary means of grace. In other words, yes, Sunday is a very ordinary thing. Every Sunday, this is what we do. But the Lord uses it in extraordinary ways. It's a means of of grace in our lives. We come, we feast on the bread of life, to use the vernacular of John 6. There's nothing so important. And this is why the author of Hebrews clearly tells us, do not neglect it. Do Do not let other things control you in such a way that you will neglect the worship of God, the assembly of the church on Sunday morning. Don't forsake it because Christ is is coming back and it's drawing near. He's coming, it's it's coming, it's, it's coming soon. And as you see that day approaching, don't neglect it. Now when it comes to Abraham, Isaac was the child he greatly loved. He waited for him. He was the child of promise. It's easy to see how Isaac might have taken the place of the Lord in his life. If it's that easy for us to let our lives revolve around our children, how easy would it have been for Abraham in this situation? And it was at this point in Abraham's life that God told Abraham, now, and I'll quote it, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Morah. Sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. Genesis 22-2. What is interesting is that Moses, the author of the book of Genesis, doesn't give us the details of the struggle that must have gone on in the heart of Abraham that evening. But we can imagine it must have been difficult. How could Abraham be expected to kill Isaac? I'm sure that Abraham thought it would be better for him to die in his son's place. But that wasn't the plan. I'm sure he he willingly would have. In a moment he would have. It didn't make sense because Isaac was the promised son and Abraham was to be a great nation because of him. It was through him that the Messiah would come. All this is supposed to happen through Isaac and God's promise to Abraham hinged on him. We don't know the details of the struggle, but we do know the outcome. In Genesis, we see Abraham's obedience. In Hebrews 11, we catch another glimpse of this outcome of the struggle that must have taken place. Abraham apparently came to the conclusion that if Isaac were to die, then he would trust God to fulfill his promise by raising Isaac from the dead. In Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, we read this. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he whom had received the promises, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac I shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. In other words, Abraham came to the conclusion, even if I go through with this, God will give him to me back because God is faithful. God let Abraham get to the point that he was going to kill his child and then he stopped him. It was a test. And then God reiterated his promise over. I'm faithful. This is the promise. I'm going to fulfill it. And it was an interesting test. It was a test of control. Who's in control here? Is it your child? Is your child going to dictate? What are you going to choose? The command of God or this? Would Abraham trust the Lord's word or would he take the driver's seat in this situation think that he knows best? And if things, get this, if things would have gone like they had before in Abraham's life, Abraham would have certainly taken matters into his own hands. 
God said, I will give you a child. Abraham got tired of waiting. So he had one with his, with Hagar. Several times in his life, he took matters into his own hands, but not this time. A.W. Tozer speaks of it this way when he writes this. I have said that Abraham possessed nothing. Yet was not this poor man rich? Everything he had owned before was still his to enjoy. Sheep, camels, herds, goods of every sort. He had also his wife and his friends. And best of all, he had his son Isaac safe by his side. He had everything, but he possessed nothing. There is the spiritual secret. There is the sweet theology of the heart which can be learned only in the school of renunciation. Does that make sense? Our possessions are not wrong. That's Tozer's point. It isn't our possessions that are wrong, but our single-minded possession of our possessions is wrong. We often seek for things, but the question is, is how do we, how do we seek for, for, for God? Some might ask at this point, how are we to seek to God then? If it's so easy to get off, the answer to that question is that we must seek him where he alone can be found, and that is in the person of Jesus Christ. Someone might follow that with, well, how do we know Jesus Christ? And the answer to that is in the book that he has given us, from the, that God has given us, that's all about Jesus. Jesus tells us that the Bible is all about him. He makes it extremely clear after the resurrection on the road to Emmaus. He teaches the disciples, starting with Moses and the prophets, that it's all about him. There's a great movement today in the evangelical church that the devil is using in a mighty way to draw people far from Christ. As he's found in the scriptures. And the irony of this movement is that this is happening through those who think they are actively seeking Christ. For these, the scriptures become a, a hindrance. The doctrines of, of scripture, the, the great teaching of scripture becomes a hindrance. The historic faith has become a, a hindrance to knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus has become what we experience in community. It has become about fellowship. It is about, about doing life together. Evangelism is about doing life with unbelievers. Talking, uh, talking about scripture and Jesus is too overwhelming, so we, we don't do it. We just be cool and hope that one day, when they learn to trust us, that one day, a week or a few years go by, that they might ask us something. I don't get it, to be honest. The, the New Testament church is to be centered around Jesus Christ. It's to put him on display, and that cannot happen apart from the word of God. Evangelism, I would agree that evangelism ought to be relational, but not relational at the expense of evangelism. <coughs> there, there must be an intentional effort to make Christ known, and to make him known does not happen apart from the scriptures. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 3.23, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. 2 Timothy 3.15, we read this concerning uh, the salvation of, of Timothy. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, Scripture which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. How does God save? He uses his word. There's no wonder that tracks that people have used to aid in conversations about the gospel are laced with scripture. I have a problem with those who say, well, it worked in the past. It just doesn't work that way anymore. Scripture's a hindrance now. I don't want to make things oversimplistic, but suggesting that, by suggesting that, that people are the same as they were in the first century in every way, of course, that's not the case. But there's a line here, though, to suggest that people were saved by being exposed to the Word of God, but now they're just exposed to people doing life in community with other people is a sham. Peter is exactly right. People must be exposed to Christ as he's presented in the Scriptures, not some perishable seed. Not good works, not friendship, not doing life together. Those are good things. Those are important things. 
Those are even important things that might lead to gospel conversations, but they lead to gospel conversations. They don't take the place of the scriptures when it comes to evangelism and making Christ known. Don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that that we must have a sign on the street corner that, that says, turn or burn or repent and perish in order to have gospel conversations with people. We don't beat people over the head with the scriptures. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we follow the example of Jesus who walked with people, who walked and did life with people, who talked with them, but he talked with them about the scriptures and pointed to himself. That's how we live. We walk with the unbeliever. We right there with them. We do. We do life together, but we talk about the scriptures. We talk about Christ. The gospel is about Jesus, and we find Jesus in the scriptures. Don't fall into the trap to say the scriptures are a hindrance. They're not. So Jesus here rebukes the crowd. He speaks of a food that endures to eternal life. The, the Son of Man will, will give them, and, and they say... To him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? This whole subject of works has come up because Jesus said in verse 27, Do not work for the food that perishes, but the food that endures to eternal life. So what Jesus is doing is he's setting them up. And they ask, "What uh, What food do you speak of that endures to eternal life? What's this work that we must do? And Jesus' answer is classic. It's one of those sentences that just hits the nail on the head. There are some of these in our uh, world that we just remember, not nearly as profound as Jesus, but but clearly uh, sometimes when we think of famous lines, we think of like uh, Caesar speaking of his military encounter with Gaul. He said, I came, I saw, I conquered. Famous line. I read not long ago of Winston Churchill during the years of World War II, Shortly after the the war had been declared against Germany, he said that he had not come to offer England an easy time or an easy victory, but rather rather blood, toil, sweat, and tears. Later, Hitler threatened them, and he tried to break the English spirit by bombing England. He said that he was going to wring England's neck as if she were a chicken. Hitler said, they bomb England, trying to break the spirit. Winston Churchill gets up and he says, some chicken crowd erupted in applause. And then he said, some neck. I I mean, what a classic response to Hitler. It was a sarcastic comment that made him look weak in just a few words. I'm going to wring your neck like a chicken. Some chicken. Some neck. Here Jesus does something similar, but more is at stake. Eternal salvation was at stake. And Jesus set the stage. He had the crowd right where he wanted them. They asked the right question. And now Jesus responds by saying this. This is the work of God that you believe on him who he has sent. We're going to get more into this next time, but let me just suffice it to say this. That the human being is is flattered by the idea of doing something for God. But what are the works of God that we should be doing? We always ask that question, what should we be doing? That's what the crowd answered. I mean, the Pharisees would have had a field day with this question. It would have been like one of those Looney Tunes where they drop the scroll and it goes on and on and on. The works of God that lead to eternal life? I mean, when does it end? Here, Jesus isn't speaking about the law. He's speaking about how one obtains eternal life. He's speaking about the gospel. The Pharisees, they would have muddied the water. They, They wouldn't have seen a distinction between law and gospel. Jesus says, if you want eternal life, you believe in Jesus Christ, you trust in Christ with your whole heart, that what he said is is true. That he is the one that came to deal with the, the curse of sin and death forever. There's no other place that salvation can be found. There's no other bread that will satisfy. There is no other way to the Father. Getting to heaven doesn't come in any other way except through Christ Jesus. 
And as we talked about earlier, it is the Christ that is found in the scriptures. Not a Christ of one's own making. It is a belief that he actively lived a perfect life. That he was obedient to the demand of the law. In other words, he fulfilled God's universal commandment to be holy. He fulfilled that. We haven't. We must believe that he was obedient for us. That his obedience comes, becomes ours through the instrument of faith or belief. But that's part of it. We get his righteousness. But what is to be made of our sin? Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for sin. He was without spot. There was no blemish. There was no corrupt thing about him. The fact is, and we just said this, the same could not be said about us. We are sinful. We've transgressed the law. The justice of God demands that our sin be dealt with. And this is the good news, that for those who believe in Jesus, their sin was imputed or placed on him, and he bore the wrath of God in his body for our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it this way. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Did you see in this verse we have what we call double, double imputation? He took our sin. Our sin was placed on him. He bore that and he did that so that we might become righteous. We gave him our sin. He gave us his righteousness. It was dumped on us. It imputed on us. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see our failures. He doesn't see every place we fall short, but he sees the obedience of Jesus Christ, which covers us like a perfect garment. The payment for sin and the righteousness of God can be yours through faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, I, I want to draw your attention back to that quote that we started with as we close here. The one by St. Augustine. The one that says God made us restless people and we are restless until we find our rest in him. Let me ask you this. Does your soul rest in Christ Jesus? This crowd that was looking for Jesus, they were a restless people. They, they wanted Jesus to provide for them he gave them their fill of food and they were satisfied for a time but then they became restless again. And it was this... So many people treat the Christian faith like this. Running from one thing to another thing that Christ offers seeking to find rest. Seeking something they can get from Him to satisfy the soul. When in reality, it's Him that satisfies the soul. They think they're satisfied. They come to him. They, they find something, but then, they, then there's this restlessness again. Rest for one soul comes through the promise of the gospel. The good news that Jesus Christ has dealt with our sin once and for all. That he has made us right with God, not by anything that we could possibly do, but by his work on our behalf. It is Christ, it is in Christ himself that we find true rest and we find Christ in the pages of Scripture. Let me pray. Thank you for listening to this sermon resource from BethelMBChurch.org. If you'd like to learn more about Bethel Church or find other resources, please visit our website at BethelMBChurch.org. Bethel Church exists to bring glory to God by promoting the joyful worship of Jesus Christ both here and abroad.